From Washington, D.C., this is Middle East Focus. I'm Jerry Firestein, Distinguished Senior Fellow and Director of the Arabian Peninsula Program at MEI. On September 21st, 2014, Houthi forces entered Yemen's capital, Sana'a, unopposed by the Yemeni military. Thus began the chain of events culminating in the civil war that has continued to this day. Now in the fifth month of a ceasefire, what are the prospects for a negotiated end to the conflict and the beginning of a sustained peace? You can subscribe to Middle East Focus on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and other podcast providers. I'm joined today by two outstanding scholars who have followed and written extensively about Yemen over the years. Fatima Abu Al-Asrar is a non-resident scholar at MEI and a senior analyst with the Washington Institute for Yemen Studies. Earlier in her career, she worked as an advisor to the Yemen Embassy in Washington, D.C., and served as a program officer for the U.K. Department for International Development in Yemen. Al-Asrar holds a master's degree in public administration from Harvard University, an MA in international relations from Johns Hopkins, and a BA in architectural engineering from Sana'a University. Ibrahim Jalal is a Yemeni security, conflict, and defense researcher based in the UK, an Erasmus scholar, and a co-founding member of the security distillery think tank. Since 2011, Ibrahim has worked with several academic, private, and non-governmental organizations in the UK, Yemen, Malaysia, Ireland, and Australia, including as a non-resident scholar at MEI. He holds an MSc in Security, Conflict, and Strategic Studies from the University of Glasgow, an MSc in Strategy and Diplomacy from the National University of Malaysia, and a BA in International Affairs from the Northern University of Malaysia. So let me start with you, Ibrahim, and and ask you, we're now in the fifth month of what presumably is at least a six-month ceasefire uh, that began in April and is now scheduled to run until the beginning of October. Uh, Where do you think we are on the ceasefire, and what has been the Uh, the security environment in Yemen over these last five months. Hello, Ambassador Jerry. Thanks for having me. I think the trajectory of the truce has been stalled, an indication of the peace stalemate that mirrors the sense of mutually hurting stalemate in, in the conflict as well. We've been in a state of extending the truce for two months for the third consecutive term, based on the initial terms. And and if we look closely at the implementation of the truce, we will easily figure out that the adherence to the truce has been unilateral, mainly on on the side of the internationally recognized government. And to exemplify this, uh, we've had more than 30 flights departing Sana'a airport. We have had over 30 fuel shipments entering the port of Hodeida with sums that exceed the total of 2021, which is last year, just in, in the months of the truce. And we've seen a cessation of hostilities or military operations on the side of the government, as opposed to uh, recent escalations, which some of which constitute uh, indisputable violations of the truth, such as the, the Houthi large-scale attack in, in Taiz. And, and Taiz was one of the provisions of the truce where we didn't see either the lifting of the siege or opening of the humanitarian corridors, which affect more than 3 million civilians. So now, in, in layman terms, it's easy for thousands of people to afford expensive flights to leave the country. Meanwhile, millions cannot use a bus to travel for 10 minutes between Al-Hawban and the city of Taiz. And and this whole situation at the moment is indicative of what after the truce and the lack of having it tied to a broader political trajectory between the internationally recognized government now, mainly with its eight-member leadership council and the Houthis on the other side. 
does mean that we stand still for both peace and conflict. This is where we stand at the moment. Thank you, Ibrahim. And let me turn to you, Fatima, and and, um, uh, Truth in Advertising. You and I have recently uh, written a draft article regarding the Houthis and where they stand on negotiations. And uh, if you wanted to to talk for a, a minute or two about what the perspective is, are the Houthis actually ready to negotiate? Ibrahim made the point that they have not fulfilled uh, their commitments, uh, particularly in reopening the roads around Taz. Do you see any prospect that the Houthis are going to engage in a political dialogue negotiation to finally bring this conflict to a sustainable end? So it is extremely complicated because um, the way that the truce is being viewed is as, you know, a cessation of facilities, specifically on the cross border aspect. But there is really little attention that's being paid to um, the violations that are happening on the local level. And as Ibrahim mentioned, Taiz was a fundamental component of the truce. Um, it was supposed to, you know, Houthis were supposed to show some good faith by opening the roads. They've um, submitted the names of three roads to be open, and actually these roads were unexistent, so they've decided to open up new roads that would make them feel, you know, secure about it, although there has been complaints that these roads could be used for their military reinforcement. And civil society introduced uh, another name of another road to be opened only for the Houthis to reject it. So they rejected a proposal that they've actually submitted only because civil society had another requirement. And I think, just as Ibrahim said, this is indicative of what's to come. There has been a pattern with the Houthis to go back on some of the concessions that they want to offer or just, you know, not offer anymore. And this is something that I feel that many Yemenis are skeptical of their sincerity in actually moving forward in good faith in talks. But at the same time, no one wants to see a political impasse. No one wants to see a stalemate in the political process because we've been on a stalemate on the military front. And now, you know, a stalemate on the political process is is actually going to worsen the situation. So in in terms of the ability for, I mean, do the Houthis have any incentive to negotiate? And I think, you know, that's the fundamental question. And I don't think that they are there yet. Um, currently, as it is, they have the power in Yemen. They have the power, I mean, of course, not in all of Yemen, but in the areas that they control. They have that power through violence. Their authority is uncontested on the ground on the in the areas that they control. And they receive many benefits from imposing, whether it's state benefits, whether it's taxes that are imposed on companies or taxes that they also collect from regular citizens, um, that all of them do not go through development. They're not accountable to anyone through the collection of these state funds, but they all go to their military um, front. And just on the beginning of September, Houthis showed a huge military parade in the city of Hodeidah. Um, and that manifestation was really one that says we're, we're prepared for war. So if the current truce is any indication, it's the fact that the Houthis want more concession from the government, want the Saudis to stop backing the government of Yemen and to end their role entirely, but they want to remain the sole entity. I don't think that they have given us any type of indication that they want to power share with other organizations, whether it is the political leadership council or any other political party in Yemen. And this is extremely concerning. Also, we see uh, we see the type of discussions that are happening in the truce, and they're mostly unilateral discussions between the UN envoy, Hans Grunberg, and the Houthi militia, and also with the UN envoy and the government separately. There has been a military coordination committee 
but they stopped meeting upon the violations that have happened in Taiz and elsewhere. So there is no progress when it comes to really the spirit of this truce, which is to go towards a political settlement. That is extremely lacking. There is no progress in terms of reduction of violence on the ground. The only reduction that's happening is on cross-border attacks. And I think that measuring the conflict that way is really problematic because it shouldn't be just about regional security. It should be about Yemeni internal security as well. Well, I think that that raises an important question, doesn't it? Because uh, there are people uh, here in the U.S. and, and elsewhere who continue to look at the conflict largely in an international context, that this is a war between Saudi Arabia and the Houthis, or a proxy war between Saudi Arabia and Iran. And yet, at its heart, it is and always has been a civil war among Yemenis, uh, and that uh, and that the Yemeni combatants uh, are, in fact, really the, the ultimate arbiters of when this conflict is going to come to an end. Uh, having, having said that, and, and uh, Fatima, I think, the question is, the Houthis have a, a long track record, frankly, of, of signing agreements and then violating them uh, almost as soon as the ink was dried, beginning in September of 2014 when they forced uh, a, uh, a renegotiation of the GCC initiative uh, called the, uh, the Peace and National Partnership Agreement, uh, and then immediately uh, after they signed it, renounced it. So what do you think are the measures. How uh, do you bring the Houthis to the negotiating table uh, in order to get to a real resolution? I feel that getting them to the negotiating table is not just enough. So, you know, one of the things that we've noted um, during the current truce is that they did not want to get to the negotiating table. I feel that they feel that they really don't want to don't want to comply with the truth because uh, they probably achieved their objectives. There was speculation that it's the flights coming out and um, out of Sana'a are not just for you know humanitarian purposes, but also to smuggle um, some people who are affiliated with either the IRGC or others out of the country with the safest possible way um, through you know, Houthi issued passports. So if they, you know, maybe have reached their objective there, they've reached their objective by, you know, saying, okay, we're going to open their the roads and ties, and then they backtracked. I don't think they feel that they have anything to offer anymore. And still, the upper hand, <laughs> they still had the upper hand because after three days of Oman mediation, they've decided to agree. And this was by, in itself, was seen as a, as a success, but it's really not a success. It, we're we're backsliding. We're just agreeing to the bare minimum, and I think that stricter measures need to be enforced in the agreement. I mean, as as it is, the way that we read the truce agreement, it's a half a page that's extremely vague that assumes that things are going to be worked out during the truce, which they almost never do. There isn't specifically any type of uh, elaboration. And, and all parties are, you know, often just creatively interpreting what this truce is all about or what they need to provide in this truce. And um, sometimes they undermine violations when it happens or overblow certain things that happen as a violation. So it's extremely important to be specific in the agreement that's, you know, parties are are signing on or agreeing on. The other thing is, you know, maybe the United Nations could provide any type of limited sanctions that are agreed upon beforehand uh, that would limit the parties from violating it. But that really needs political willingness uh, on the side of the Houthis to 
actually agree to engage. So I can understand the difficulty on getting this process going, but also once it gets going, there needs to be consequences for any types of violations. If there are no consequences, then you know we're going nowhere. Part of the consequences could actually be raising the gravity of these issues to the UN level. We see concern, we see condemnation, and I think that's the right track. Um, and that's the way that things should go, is that the, the United Nations need to be vocal about any harm to the civilians that happen, but there needs to be some type of consequence on the discussion as well um, and on the overall, because as it is, the dynamic is regardless of what happens, whether the Houthis comply or do not comply, then there is no consequence. If they do something on Taz, they will probably be praised. But if they don't do anything, there is zero consequence to them violating the truth. And uh, this pattern has to be broken um, either by raising pressure, understanding this dynamic that Houthis are benefiting from, and um, for the UN to really figure out a mechanism whereby you could hold the parties to the conflict accountable. Ibrahim, aside from the the issue of the of the Houthi government conflict, uh, we've recently seen an outbreak of uh, uh, violence fighting uh, between uh, members within what was expected to be a more unified uh, government uh, side between, particularly the Islah Party and members of uh, southern militias. And how how do you interpret that? What do you make of that? And how is that going to affect the ability of the Presidential Leadership Council to actually sit at a negotiating table if we get there with the Houthis? That's really the core of why the Houthis bargain on time. It is the fact that they've seen the other side, the government of Yemen divided before the very formation of the PLC. And now with the formation of the PLC and, and the representation of different agendas and, and groups whose prime objective are at core different and contradictory. Uh, the recent events that we saw in Shabwa and to a lesser extent in Abiyan Hadramaut just capture the security dilemma within the PLC itself. And this indicates that the the ability of the PLC led by President Rashad Al-Alimi to establish its, its legitimacy on the ground, given, of course, the legal blowbacks that it faces, is an uneasy job. And, and, and I think it, an anecdote is to imagine the president being based out of, of Ma'ashik, the Ma'ashik Palace in Aden, without being seen uh, with the public in Aden, in a public market, or even another governorate. And, and over time, we, you know, the big fear is that develops a, a sort of disconnect from the core issues on the ground, but also widen the gaps and expectations within the PLC itself, between the PLC and the people who, in fact, have lost hope after the second month of, of PLC in, in position. On the day uh, the PLC was announced, people told that the biggest dilemma Yemen has was uh, President Hadi. Eventually, it was a delusion or uh, a shortcoming in imagination that combining eight different groups with uh, no monopoly of violence, but in fact, multiplicity of armed groups who do not subscribe uh, to civic and human rights-centric legal lines is not the answer. And with that, we saw the fighting and, and we saw the Houthis immediately afterwards do some escalations here and there, which is uh, very expected. And therefore, to say that the Houthis are genuinely interested to engage in a comprehensive peace process today is an overstatement. They bargain on further fragmentation within the PLC itself. They had expected that within the first two to three months. That happened just a few months afterwards. And the Houthis also understand what the Saudis want and, and, and the coalition as a whole. They want a face-saving exit. And therefore, 
they would not give them that easily unless it's by the terms the Houthis want. And these terms have been some way or the other been reflected on how the truce was extended uh, or even the announcement of flights to, to Djibouti before the Djibouti authorities announce that they will not take place. So the security environment in the South is fragile. The objectives of represented actors under the umbrella of the PLC are different, as has been proven. And there are no assurances that they would be able to develop a unified approach to manage these differences. And this is a big issue that would reflect in in negotiations. Uh, If you're manifesting these differences on the ground in territories that theoretically fall under your control, how would you bring about uh, a harmonization of these views when you want to negotiate a comprehensive roadmap with the Houthis and on multiple tracks, the security track, security sector reform, the transitional peace process and the shape of, of the political system, and of course, uh, transitional justice, uh, which now many actors would would fear from. So in short, the PLC sits in a, in a tighter position than that of President Hadi, and coupled with the lacking autonomy even at the decision-making levels, uh, we can expect further excessive level of interventionism by regional stakeholders so as to reflect the agendas which were taking place anyhow before the very formation of the PLC and and, and why certain things happened that way. And interestingly enough, speaking of Shabwa, uh, there have been uh, widely circulating news of, of the French Legion forces to sort of secure the Belha facility and I don't think there was a notable French deployment in Yemen. And this is also a reflection of the changing sands in Yemeni security environment and, and the level of interventionism that now merits further examination as the country continues to fragment further as uh, armed militias further increase in, in number, direction, ideologies, but also ambition. And finally, the one point I want to make is that war theaters are very fluid. Today, they could be in Chabwa. Tomorrow, they would uh, reoccur in, in Ma'rib and, and change according to the mood of not only local actors, but also regional backers and allies. That's very interesting, Ibrahim. And, and one might speculate that the French interest in securing Belhoff is a reflection also of the need in Western Europe to secure uh, oil and gas supplies wherever they might be. And uh, uh, given Total's uh, presence in in Yemen, that might be a a possible source of supply for uh, the Europeans going forward. Uh, Let me ask you, um, President Dalimi is going to be in New York uh, later this month uh, to uh, participate in the UN General Assembly. He's going to be speaking uh, I think on the 22nd of September. And uh, what what do you expect him to say if you were advising him? What would you suggest that he say to uh, the uh, General Assembly? And what do you think Yemeni uh, civilians back home uh, will want to hear him say? Oh, that's a, a very loaded question. Uh, and, and I hope there, there is no day to advise <laughs> this complicated political architecture. But I think as, as President Lalimi heads to to New York and address the General Assembly in September, I think his core message would be to garner support for his regime, especially in light of, of, of the invasion of Ukraine and, and the comparison between Yemen and, and Ukraine, regardless of geographical proximity to Europe and Western interests. Is, is, of course, the paradoxical amount and mobilization of arms in the way, in the unto peace and, 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 and the survival of the Ukrainian regime and people in the face of the unprovoked aggression there, uh, militarily unprovoked at least. And, and there'll be an opportunity for, for the president to address that this whole argument that there is only one way to end the conflict in Yemen is just one way. And there are multiple ways 
if the council is unified, the presidential council, which is at the moment not. And and the second, of course, to to garner economic support for his regime to improve the ability to deliver services and therefore reflect in mitigating the humanitarian consequences in the public. And we talk about the humanitarian landscape. Uh, it's important for President Alimi to assert the importance of supporting the shift to recovery and development efforts. Uh, should the conflict continue to drag because the the amount of uh, humanitarian pledges and, and, and contributions have been mind-boggling when we look at the numbers. Over $16 billion at minimum, and these could have been reoriented to very localized needs of, of the Yemeni public at governorate levels, from uh, education to job provision to entrepreneurship. To, to, of course, uh, humanitarian aid, but with the overall objective of reducing reliance uh, on, on humanitarian aid, which, of course, nurtures the, the, the culture of non-work, and, and that's going to be one of, one of the core issues. And, and the third message is to talk to, to the public with, with openness about the whole situation. Uh, because President Lalimi now stands in, in a historical moment where many of the foundations of the Yemeni Republic have been thrown away. And, and in moments like this, a moment of honesty and courage uh, must be at least placed on, on, on record if there are no tools uh, of power and coercion to influence that direction. And... New York would be a spot to to do that, and finally uh, is of course to to increase the level of of coordination with the United States uh, and 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 the UK when it comes to rebuilding the Yemeni armed forces, not only in the fields of counter terrorism but also counter narrotics, uh stabilization units, and and development of professional units that can be the bedrock. Of, of future military and security forces in the country, especially when taking into account the number of militias that we have. And when we look at the situations in Lebanon and uh, Iraq and, and beyond, I think these are, are the four things I would uh, highlight. Excellent. Thank you, Ibrahim. In our in our last few minutes, Fatima, if you wanted to share uh, a few thoughts as well about uh, the Presidential Leadership Council and how you see that uh, going forward, and also um, looking at the bigger picture, uh, there's been some speculation that perhaps um, uh, some of the uh, breaking uh, diplomatic ice in the region, you know, return of uh, uh, Emirati and Kuwaiti ambassadors to Tehran, uh, ongoing dialogue between Saudi and and Iran, uh, as well as you know what one still hopes will be a successful resolution of the JCPOA negotiations in Vienna. Um, do you see the changing regional environment as uh, perhaps assisting uh, the UN led uh, negotiating process inside of Yemen? Yes. So a couple couple of things. Um, and so far that diplomatic relations are being, again, reestablished uh, with Iran. There's a move towards the GCPOA that might, to some extent, just, you know, generate a positive relationship. Um, it will entirely depend on how Iran could cooperate and give something back um, and uh enter in terms of any type of agreement or pact that would ensure the region's uh, stability. It might be somewhat far-fetched because being from the region, we understand also that Iran has uh, just greater ambition that goes beyond its border. Um, and it has a history and relationship with all of its militias in the Middle East. Um, and these militias survive through violence um, um, and without that component, without that destabilization component, I don't know what that relationship might be. So if, if we're hopeful that it would go to that direction, but I'm not entirely sure that it will. 
The second is, as as we mentioned earlier, a lot of the conflict in Yemen is is a Yemeni conflict. Um, uh, it's Yemenis will have to figure out how to talk to each other. The Presidential Leadership Council is probably a case in point because um, if we're thinking about a, a coalition government with the Houthis, it will more or less look like that. It would be factions that fought with each other that will shake hands at one point and another. Um, like so many things in theory look good and you don't know how it would play out until it's implemented. And the PLC in theory was was great, but I think the expectations of it working were low to begin with, working effectively the way it should. It was concerning that the SS- STC that is now part of the government is taking unilateral decision, putting the president in a very difficult place. And, you know, just as Ibrahim said, there is very little faith that this this PLC establishment government could actually produce a coherent vision on anything. I mean, they'll, I, I doubt that they could meet together for lunch, let alone, you know, draft something towards the direction of, of you know, future negotiations. But um, where I'm hopeful is that this is a start, that through the ability of all of them to work together and diffuse conflicts together, that things could maybe, you know, be influenced uh, positively. So in a sense, it's it's also kind of like a reminder of the National Dialogue Conference. We all knew that, you know, at the end of the National Dialogue, it may not really hold, but it had been a start in terms of the vision that wanted to be provided for Yemen. And this is one of the things that Yemenis keep uh, going back to. So um, I hope when Rashad Al-Alimi is, you know, kind of just reconsiders a, a greater role for for this presidential council and and in fulfilling its obligations and in being in being for all Yemenis, not just for the region. The SDC cannot. I mean, now that it's bar- part of the government, needs to look at its entire alliances and not just its own region. So just finding a way where there's unity among members as opposed to divisions, I think that would that would help Yemen. But also at the same time, I think this is a moment in Yemen's history where Yemenis are trying to figure out the directions that they want to go. And where we're realizing that there isn't just one Yemeni, a one point of view. You have the Houthis are now a, an entity that is although small in numbers, but they have their own power that is very difficult to deny. The same with SDC, the same with the Hadramis. It's a moment where Yemenis are trying to figure themselves out after, you know, 30 years of being told this is the way things are. <laughs> so there is violent expression, but this violent expression can can only be tamed by the policymakers and by pressure from other international actors to uh, focus on a peace process rather than, you know, communication through violence. So, you know, that, that, that's extremely important. But I really think that Yemen is, is exactly where Iraq was um, after, you know, after the conflict and after the removal of Saddam. It's just, again, just people are trying to figure out where they, where they want to be. And, and, um, ultimately, as this process of violence ends, there needs to be a process of reconciliation, and we want to get there sooner rather than later. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Fatima. And uh, th- those are all incredibly important questions. Um, Tim Lenderking, the U.S. Special Envoy, is uh, making another swing through the region. Uh, one, uh, one hopes that he can make some progress. Um, as uh, as you said early on in the in the conversation, uh, you know we need to move beyond uh, Hans Grunberg uh, engaging unilaterally with the Houthis on one side, the government on the other. Uh, there needs to be some movement. One can hope uh, that uh, during um, his engagements in New York, President Alimi will have some opportunities to press this point home. Uh, with uh, the senior UN leadership, uh, as well as other uh, key players in the international community, uh, we're going to have to wait and see how that's going to turn out. Uh, I'm afraid that that's all we have time for today. Uh, I want to thank uh, Fatima and Ibrahim uh, for joining us for this discussion. 
And I especially want to thank you, our listeners, for joining the program. This has been a presentation of the Middle East Institute. To support MEI's programs and podcasts, please donate at www.mei.edu. Thank you for your support. Thank you.